Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture we read just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 15. Today we're on part three, the biggest choir and stage show in history, and truly that is the case because the entire congregation was singing unto the Lord, not singing about the Lord, but they were singing unto him. And there were at least, I think, more than six million people, some folks put it at two million, but there were a lot of people that were singing to the Lord at this point. And with Miriam and the other women dancing, you've got your stage show, so it's the largest, the biggest choir and biggest stage show in all of history. We're in Exodus chapter 15. And we're on part three tonight, or today. Last week we looked at the second division of the song, verses four through eight. Pharaoh's chariots and his horse hosts hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them, they sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. God does not put up with rebellion. I hope you get that. That's one of the major themes of Scripture. God never tolerates rebellion. And it's not merely rebellion against him, but it's rebellion against his appointed order of authority, his chain of command. He's given a chain of command in relation to government. He's given a chain of command in relation to the family. He's given a chain of command in business. He's given a chain of command in the church. And when there is rebellion, it is not merely rebellion against the intermediate authority, it's rebellion against the ultimate authority whom God has placed in that position. No one gets to a position of authority without the divine appointment of God. Now sometimes those in positions of authority are in rebellion against God and they may command you to do something that is contrary to the word of God and so we know that you always obey the highest authority. But too often we are committed to doing what we want to do and if authority tells us to do something different than what we want to do, we think I'm justified in not doing it because that's not what I want to do. No, the only time we can rebel against intermediate authority, the ultimate divine authority is God, but intermediate authority over us, the only time that we can do that is when we are commanded by the intermediate authority to do something that is contrary to the word of God, or we are prohibited from doing something that is required by the word of God. And in which case, you say, I will obey God. If God said, go next door and blow the brains of your Jewish neighbor out, you don't do that because that's forbidden by the word of God. Or if those in positions of authority say, you must go out and be engaged in prostitution, you can say, no, that is forbidden by the word of God. Now those are extreme examples, but those are the only times when we can disobey authority that is intermediate between God and us, is when it causes us or tells us we must disobey the commands or principles of the Word of God, or when it says you may not do what God commands you to do. For example, God has commanded us to meet together for worship. Suppose government comes in and says you as Christians no longer have the right and privilege of worship. Now they can take away the properties, but does that mean we are therefore free because we say, well, we have to obey those in authority over us, so we, we better not get together for worship with one another. Better not get together for the study of the word and for prayer. No, because God has commanded those things. You still have to do it. You may have to do it in secret. You may have to do it with risk. You may have to do it with the threat of being imprisoned or even put to death. But you must obey the ultimate authority, which is God. God hates rebellion. Uh, we find that all the way through the book of Exodus, in fact, all the way through Scripture here. But in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Don't rebel against God, because he will overthrow you. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Now what we saw last week, very quickly in summary, verses 1 through 3, give the introduction to the song. That includes the title, the story summary, the participants, and the purpose of the song. Verse 3 is the introduction to the second section, and verses 4 through 8 gives a capsule summary of the war that occurred. 
Verse 3 states that Jehovah God gets all the credit for the battle. The next five verses tell how he won the battle. That's a quick summary there of those uh, first eight verses. Verse 3, what stated, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. That gave a very interesting comment on how Pharaoh's chariots and his army ended in the sea. Pharaoh's chariots and his host were cast into the sea. Now from Pharaoh's perspective, Pharaoh's sitting there, he's making his decisions. And each one of us sit there day by day and we have certain input, it comes to us, and we make our decisions based on that input. But I hope that when we make our decisions, it's not merely based on the input that we have from our physical senses, we have input coming in. Like you're driving down the street, you see a red light. Um, well, it hasn't got turned red yet. It's yellow, but you're still half a block away. You're going to make a decision because you know by the time you get to that light, it's going to be red. So you punch it to the floor and you try to still make it into the intersection on the yellow. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you come to a stop. And you're glad you did because there was a guy coming down the hill. I saw this actually happen. A guy coming down the hill as lights were changing. I was on an interstate highway. There was a car that decided it was going, it wasn't the interstate, it was a state highway, but it was like a multi-lane highway with a divider in the middle. And there was a guy coming down the hill in a semi-truck. And he was coming toward the light. And he could see that it was going to turn. And so he kept on coming and the guy ran the red light and I watched from about 100 yards away as he hit that car. It spun all the way around, spun across the median, didn't turn over, praise the Lord, and the guy staggered out of his car unhurt. Boggles the mind. I saw that happen. People made decisions, split-second decisions. The driver of the semi assumed that that guy was going to stop. That guy was going to try to punch it to the floor and beat the yellow light from turning red on him. And he didn't make it, and the light turned green, and the truck came on. You make decisions, folks. But I hope that the decisions you make are not merely based on the physical input of the world around you. That the decisions you make are based upon the Word of God and the principles that you know, not merely the direct commands and the direct prohibitions. Some people say, well, I live by the Ten Commandments. Well, you've got a way too limited view of the Word of God. The Ten Commandments gives you some basic framework and structure. You're not saved by it. You're not sanctified by it. But it tells you what God doesn't like. But the Word of God is filled with principles and commands and directions as to how to live our life. So, the things that we have from the physical world that are coming to us, and Pharaoh had a lot of that, should be tempered by, guided by, directed by the Word of God. That is what helps us to interpret the world around us and know how we should respond to all the physical stimuli that come into our lives, the interactions that we have with other people, the commands that we're given from those in authority, the commands that we who are in positions of authority, for example, in a family, will give to those who are under our authority. We may like or dislike certain things going on, but the question is, what does the Word of God have to say about it? Are there principles and priorities that God has for us in the way in which we live our Christian life? Well, see, Pharaoh had that. Pharaoh had stimuli from the world around him. He had just been through ten visible, tangible plagues. Now, he can, he can wipe it off to chance if he wants to. He can say, well, we offended the gods of Egypt because the plagues were against the gods of Egypt. The scripture says so. We've offended those gods, and so they're the ones that did it. But you see, he didn't merely have physical stimuli because Moses was God's spokesman. And Moses came into Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, let my people go, and if you do not, here's what's going to happen. And Pharaoh refused to take divine directive and apply it to temporal circumstances. And he's still a stubborn idiot when he comes to the edge of the Red Sea and he has one more chance because the night before Moses lifted up his rod, it says the Shekinah glory of God stood between the army of Pharaoh on the one hand and the Israelites on the other hand. 
And it was darkness so thick they couldn't see their hand in front of their face for the Egyptians. It says they couldn't even move out of their places because they didn't know what was there. But it says it gave light unto Israel all night long. Pharaoh could have said, you know, I've just been through the death of my firstborn son, the guy who's going to sit on the throne of Egypt next. You know, I think maybe God is telling me something. And as God parted the sea all that night, the next morning, the Shekinah was still between Israel and Egypt. But the Egyptians could hear them moving, and they followed, and they saw the walls of water on both sides. And Pharaoh, like a typical pagan jerk, commanded those under his authority to do the stupidest thing possible, which is follow them in between walls of water that were 600 feet high on each side. And some Christians act like pagans. They do that which is absolutely stupid. Absolutely, they should have learned from experience, if not from the word of God, that when you rebel against God, you are in serious trouble. Yeah, that's what we find here. From Pharaoh's perspective, and certainly from the perspective of the army, they were totally independent from God in the action that they took. You know, we don't care about God. You know, he can't do anything to us. After all, the Jews are here in the middle of the water with us. What's he going to do to us? I mean, they could have rationalized it all kinds of different ways. It was their own so-called free will that they went charging in after the Jews. They were chasing Jews. They were avenging Egypt. They were obeying Pharaoh, who they believed was the God-man. They had no respect for the God of the Jews. In their opinion, they weren't being irresistibly drawn along, but the scripture here tells us they were. God had put a hook in their jaws and was pulling them into the sea. But they thought they were doing it on their own free will. But it was happening because they were in rebellion against the God of the universe. God grabbed them and he catapulted them into the sea by a God that they hated. God has a different, more realistic viewpoint than pagan mankind. They were very much on the palm of God's fist, even though they were not aware of it. He was hurling them into the sea. That's what it says. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast. That's a word for throwing the force. Hath he cast into the sea. They would never see dry land again. They would never see their families again. They would never see their farms again. They would never see their bank accounts again. They would never see anything in this world again. They were as good as dead men even as they screamed curses at the Jews. Because it was God, not Pharaoh, who was in control. People, we are accountable to God, but God is sovereign. It's hard to put those two ideas together. How can we be accountable for the things that we do if God is sovereign and has determined the end from the beginning? How do we put those things together? Well, think of it this way. Think about railroad tracks. I know all of you have at one point or another, probably when you were kids, now that you're older you know better than to do this, but you've stood on a railroad track and you've looked down the tracks. I hope you don't do this anymore because a train may be coming from behind. But you stood on the railroad tracks and you look down the tracks. And the tracks are perfectly parallel, but as they get farther away, they seem to come closer and closer and closer and closer together. Underneath, they're held together by railroad ties, which keep them absolutely parallel and aligned. And a lot of times that's completely covered with gravel, so you don't see the ties that hold the two things together. But they are held together. If they were not held together, the train would immediately go off the tracks because the tracks would split. And yet thousands of cars, of trains, go by every day, and the rails stay perfectly parallel. They look like they come together in the 
down there, but no, no matter how far you walk, they never come together. But underneath they are held together by ties you don't see. It's like that with the sovereignty of God who plans the very details of all of creation in their most minutia. Not a sparrow falls without your father. It doesn't say not a sparrow falls without your father's knowledge. It says not a sparrow falls without your father. Your father is the one who takes out the sparrows. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now that's pretty good in terms of minutia. That's tiny details. And you know, you're losing some every day if you get older. Pharaoh was accountable. He's responsible. That's one track. God is sovereign. That's the other track. We can look down and we say, well, they've got to come together someplace down there. We don't know how it does it. But they're held together by that which is invisible underneath the railroad ties. So our responsibility is not to try to figure it out and reject it if it doesn't fit our human thinking. Our responsibility is to believe it, to know that God will hold us accountable for the choices that we make. We think we're functioning on the basis of our own choice, our own free will. Well, you better make sure that your choices are directed by the Word of God, not merely by temporal circumstances around you, that they're directed by the Word of God, because that's what holds together the sovereignty of God over here and the responsibility, the accountability of man over here. Make sure you know those ties that hold the track together at every mile of the journey because you're going to go through a journey that lasts many miles and has many different ties underneath that affect the world around you and the scenery changes. Part of the time you're driving across the desert, part of the time you're driving up the mountains, part of the time you're driving across a river, part of the time you're on that bridge, part of the time you're not on a bridge, part of the time you're looking at water, part of the time you're looking at trees. Your circumstances change, the events of life change, but the rails run parallel all through life. And this is what holds them together. Make sure you know it, because if you pull out some of the ties that hold the rails together, the train goes off its track. Pharaoh didn't get it. He was only motivated by his hatred within for the God of the Jews, by his carnal desire that, hey, here goes my labor force, and I'm going to lose a lot of money, and I'm not going to be able to do all the things I want to do. He was motivated by the wrong thing. Can you imagine, what if Pharaoh had gotten converted after the first plague, Pharaoh says, whoa, there's a God in heaven. There's a God who really can do something. Suppose he did it after the second of the plagues, or the third or the fourth. I mean, he didn't have to go too far if he had repented and said, you know what, Moses, I want you to tell me more about your God. He's God. I'm going to humble myself in front of him right now. I'm going to humble himself, myself in front of my people right now. I'm going to declare that God alone, Jehovah, is God. Do you think there would have been a change in world history? I think so. There had definitely been a change in Pharaoh's life. How about your life? How about your life? When you hear what the Word of God has to say, when people tell me they're Christians, and I've never met them before, I say to them, Oh, really? Tell me. How has being a Christian changed your life? Because God, when he takes you as his own, he'll take you in whatever condition you are, but he won't leave you there. The Holy Spirit will begin to work on your heart. You'll begin to crave the word of God. You'll begin to grow in Christ. The old things will pass away and all things will become new. You will no longer walk in the path that you used to walk. He will change your life. Someone claims to be a Christian, ask them. Oh, really? So how has that changed your life? We have the sovereignty of God. We have the responsibility of man. At some point, you must come to that first starting tie on the tracks which is faith. 
where you trust in Jesus Christ who died for your sins, who was buried, who rose from the dead the third day, and at that point your journey can begin, your real journey, and the rails, rails won't wobble and you won't have the questions that you always had. You'll be able to go to the Word of God and say, man, this is what's got the answers. I don't understand everything, but I know it's true. I believe it's true. And as I study, God will illumine my heart to understand His Word. That Word is a lamp. It's a light to my feet. The Word of God gives direction and instruction. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Do you understand what Pharaoh didn't? That there's a sovereign God? Well, Pharaoh thought he was doing his own thing. He didn't know there was much in the hand of the sovereign God. The sovereignty of God is first and foremost in view in what happened to Pharaoh. We saw that repeatedly in the Bible. We gave you a few sample verses last week. I'll just give you those few out of Job. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away, and who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? You can't ask God, what is he doing? Daniel said, in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar said the same thing. Uh, Job understood the sovereignty of God, yet you have to approach it with humility and not with pride. Nebuchadnezzar walked in pride. So God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And finally at the end, after God restored his mind to him and he was no longer crawling around and eating grass like an ox and his fingernails growing long like the talons of a, a bird and his hair growing out and he was the most disheveled person on earth, when God gave him his understanding, he says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the most high. Oh, if only Pharaoh would have done this. God gave Nebuchadnezzar one chance. Nebuchadnezzar blew it, but God restored him. God gave Pharaoh ten plague chances, and he gave him two chances before he entered the sea. Pharaoh rejected them all, and so that was the end of Pharaoh's army. That was the end of his kingdom. That was the end of his nation. That was a crash in Egypt. I bless the Most High God, this Nebuchadnezzar is speaking, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And listen, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And there is none that can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Same thing that Job had said. You can't say to him, what doest thou? What do you think you're doing? Hey, God, I want you to understand, this is not my way. I want you to do it this way. You can't treat God like that. He's not your lackey. He's not your servant. The God of the universe is sovereign. And he will do even to kings what he designs to do. Where the man stands in rebellious opposition to him, to him will happen what happened to Pharaoh. We saw that the Apostle Paul uses Pharaoh as an illustration of the sovereignty of God. People like to question God, well, you know, why did God do this? Or, well, if God's sovereign like that, then I'm not responsible. Paul, Paul answers those questions in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In other words, God is not obligated to treat you nice. Did you know that? God is not obligated to treat you nice. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Here are a bunch of pagans out there. Is he obligated to the pagans? Tell me, in what way is God obligated to the pagans? He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, question of free will, verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. You know, trying hard. You're beating the rest of the pack. You know, I've talked to a lot of people over my life. <laughs> there are a lot of them who say, well, you know, I'm not as bad as Hitler. Or I'm not as bad as Stalin. Or I'm not as bad as Mao or Pol Pot or you name the dictator, you can come up with all kinds of names. Not as bad as. In other words, you're running faster than they did. You're doing a better job than Stalin did. Whoopie do. So what? Well, yeah, 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 but I, I, I'm better than all those. Uh, in fact, I'm better than my neighbor. I'm better than all those hypocrites at church. So what? You're not getting into heaven 
by beating them in the race for goodness. Did you ever think about that? You will not get to heaven by being better than everybody else. Otherwise, only one person would make it to heaven. Because there was only one person who was better than everyone else. <laughs> Jesus. You'll never equal him, believe me. You will never equal him. If we're in a race and only the top 1% get in, do you think you're going to make it? No. You won't make it. Think about all the people who've lived through history. Think about all those who've died for their faith. Have you died for your faith? Have you ever faced somebody who said, stand up against the wall? Now, those of you who are Christians, you stay there. But those of you who are willing to deny Jesus, you can go. What would you do? I think some of us would say, I'm out of here, man. Because I, I, I really still believe in my heart, but I'm, I don't want to get shot. Friends all over the world, it's happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you think you're in the top 1% just because you're in an American church? Was it not the grace of God that put you here? Was it not the grace of God that had you born in this country? Did God have to have you born here, or could he have you been born in central India? Or in central China? Or in Russia? It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith, now here he uses Pharaoh, which is what our text is all about. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have raised thee up. Did you know God has a purpose for your life? Say, yeah, 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 I got a purpose for my life because I'm saved. Did you know God had a purpose for Pharaoh's life? God had a purpose for Pharaoh's life, which means God had a purpose for Hitler's life. God had a purpose for Mao Zedong's life. God had a purpose for Pol Pot's life. God had a purpose for Lenin's life. God had a purpose for Stalin's life. God had a purpose for, you think of the worst guy, Genghis Khan. God had a purpose for each one of them. Now let's learn what the specific purpose of God was for Pharaoh. For him, being conceived out of all the possible combinations of eggs and sperm that could have gotten together with his parents, one choice was made. God was the one who made that decision as to which one would swim fastest. It tells us here, God had a purpose for Pharaoh. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Now here's the purpose, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God's purpose was to glorify himself. See, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, it is, because he alone deserves glory. You don't deserve glory. I don't deserve glory. We don't deserve honor. We don't deserve privilege. We don't deserve mercy or grace. We don't deserve anything except hell. That's what I deserve. But God said, I'm going to put a big guy up there who's going to have a really hard heart, who's going to be really stubborn, who's going to reject every opportunity that I give to him, so that I can crush him in the most powerful manner possible, and that will glorify my name, and it will put all the pagans in terror of the God of Israel. They won't bother you guys on your way into the land. You see, God's purpose was to show the nations of the earth that he was God, and that Israel was his chosen people. Do you think he did that at the crossing of the Red Sea? I think it's pretty obvious. I think he truly did do that. And then it says in verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom thou have mercy. Did the Jews deserve it? No. God calls them over and over in the Old Testament stiff-necked and rebellious people. He chose to have mercy on them in spite of themselves, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, complaining against God. Well, he can't find fault with me because I can't resist his will. He's omnipotent. So there's nothing I could do about it. <laughs> Here's the answer. Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? 
Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? I don't like it. I want you to make me different. Well, you know what? He will make you different if you trust in Christ. He will transform your life. He will give you new purpose and new joy and new hope and new peace and new opportunities for service. I don't like the way he made me. Well, trust Christ. I don't want to trust Christ. I just want to complain about God. Dear friend, you're accountable even if God is sovereign. And if you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will spend eternity in hell. And that is a literal, real, eternal burning hell. For those who in rebellion against God have refused his offer of salvation. How do you think you can get away with replying against God? That's what Paul is saying here. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel and to honor and another to dishonor? If you're a potter, how many of you, just like to see a show of hands, how many of you have ever seen a potter actually doing the foot pedal thing and having the, the wheel spinning and he's got a lump of clay and he makes different kinds of vases? How many of you have ever seen that? A few of you, yes, good. It's fascinating to watch. And you know sometimes, and I've seen this, the guy is making it, and then he finds there's a little imperfection in the clay. So he stops the wheel, smashes the clay down, pulls out the little pebble or whatever was in there, throws it away, starts the process again, and maybe makes something totally different. Does he have the right to do that? Yes or no? Nod yes. Okay. <laughs> we got all my... Anybody who thinks no, shake your head this way. God doesn't have the right to make me how he wants. <laughs> you have anybody? Out? No, nobody out there. Okay. The potter has power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. He can make a beautiful vase that you set on your dining room table, or he can make a spittoon. You know, that's a vessel that's a dishonorable vessel. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, that's what he did with Pharaoh. He wanted to show his wrath, he wanted to make his power known, but he gave Pharaoh a chance endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He gave him chance after chance after chance after chance after chance after chance, and Pharaoh would not. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Half the times it tells us Pharaoh hardened his heart. Half the times it tells us God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Who did it? Parallel railroad tracks Sovereignty of God underrides all with his purposes. Man's responsibility and man's accountability is the other track. And God gave Pharaoh a whole lot of miles on his track before he took him out. Well, the 13 things, and we'll just summarize these very quickly. I added a lot in between there. You probably noticed that. But we learned 13 things concerning Pharaoh, that Paul says about Pharaoh, which is the key to our text, 13 things we learned last week. The mercy, number one, the mercy of God is not earned. It is sovereignly bestowed. That was number one. The mercy of God is not earned. It is sovereignly bestowed. I hope you were taking notes. If you missed some of them last week, I'm just going to go through these quickly. Number two, man does not have free will. And we talked about why that is so. So if you want to write that down while I'm talking, I'll repeat that quickly. Man does not have free will because obviously the truly free will is the will that can accomplish that which it desires with no obstacles in the way. You have to be omnipotent to have a free will. If I want to jump from here to the moon, I can try all day long, and I can truly determine I'm going to do it. But my will is not free, because I am limited by physical reality. If I want to be a millionaire tomorrow, I can spend every nickel that I have on the lottery, and it's not going to happen. Say, but it might happen. Yeah, and you're wasting God's resources. It is required in stewards, says Paul, that a man be found faithful. 
what you have is not your own. What you have belongs to God. Do you think he's going to let you squander the resources so that you no longer have to trust him, but that you're going to trust the lottery? That's an issue of faith, isn't it? Will you trust God to provide for you? Or do you want to be able to say, I don't have to trust God anymore. i got money in the bank. I don't have to believe that verse, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, because i got enough to take care of me for the rest of my life, and it may end tonight. Be careful when you're dealing with the world around you, for it will tempt you. It will seek to draw you into the pit. Yes, man does not have free will because to have free will you have to be omnipotent. You have to be omniscient. You have to be omnipresent so that you can accomplish it. There is only one truly free will in the universe and that is the will of God. He alone and determined the end from the beginning. You can set out with all good purposes, all good mechanics, uh, all necessary supplies and resources and you may not reach your destination because there's one thing that you didn't see that was going to be in the road ahead of you. Only God has the end from the beginning. Only God can have truly free will. My will, your will, is limited because we are creatures and not the Creator. We are accountable because the one free will in the universe has told us what we must do. And it starts with faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Don't leave off the last phrase, Acts 16.31. That was number two. Our time is running out. Here we go. Number three was the purposes of God include reprobation. The purposes of God include reprobation. That is, in this case, raising Pharaoh up specifically for the purpose of destroying him. Number four. I hope you got most of these last week as we went through, but I'm doing them quickly just so you get them down. Number four, God destroys the rebels to terrify the rest of the earth. That's what he said in the text we just read it a minute ago. Even though they'll still refuse to obey him. Number five, God destroys rebels to glorify his own name and to prove that nobody's rebellion is ever going to succeed. God destroys rebels to terrify the rest and he destroys them to glorify his name and prove that rebellion will never succeed. Number six, God not only shows mercy, but God hardens hearts to demonstrate all the aspects of his character, not merely to accomplish his purposes, but it demonstrates all the attributes of God's divine character. Number seven, and this was the answer to those questions, that is no excuse for man to make the argument of fatalism. Oh, well, what will be will be. No, that's not an excuse for that. Instead, it should be a wake-up call to obey the sovereign God. It's not an argument for fatalism. Number eight, that is no excuse for man to make an accusation against God. No excuses for accusing God. He is holy. We are sinful. How can the sinful accuse the holy of unrighteousness? Book of Habakkuk asks that question. Number nine, the sovereignty of God is no excuse for man to give up and refuse to turn to God. How do you give up? He's sovereign. No. You're accountable. Turn to him. Number 10. We're made of dirt, just like Adam. When we die, we return to dust. But God is unchanging. You and I change. Every day we change. We flip-flop. How many of you have ever flip-flopped in your life? Come on, let's see the hands. Have you ever flip-flop? You decided one thing, and then you changed your mind, decided to do something else? Yeah, I think we've all done that. Some people didn't raise their hand. I worry about those people. <laughs> we all flip-flop. God is unchanging, we are not. Number 11, the creature has no rights to challenge the Creator. Why have you made me thus? We have no rights. Do you get it? We are already guilty. We are already found guilty. We have no rights 
to decide what's going to happen in the legal system. We can't bribe an attorney. We can't bribe a judge. Because the attorney and the judge is Jesus. And he's perfect. Number 12. The purposes of God include showing his wrath against sin as well as showing his grace and mercy. A lot of churches only focus on the love of God. They fail to warn their people, some of whom sitting in the pews feeling very good and warm and fuzzy don't realize they're on the way to hell and they never get warned that judgment is coming. God's purpose is including showing wrath as well as showing grace. Number 13, God has the right to sovereignly exercise grace to those who do not deserve it. You and I did not deserve the grace of God. Just as much as he has the right to sovereignly exercise wrath, now listen carefully, to exercise wrath against those who truly deserve it. Don't complain about God's judgment because, folks, all of us deserve God's judgment. If you want to talk about what we deserve, we deserve wrath. We don't deserve grace. We, we deserve the judgment of God, not his mercy. The question is not, and you've heard me say this many times before, and you'll probably hear me say it many times again. The question is not, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? Because that assumes that man deserves to go to heaven. And the man doesn't deserve to go to hell. The correct question is, how can a righteous God send anybody to heaven? Because we deserve hell. How can he send anybody to heaven? And that is answered by the cross. That's how he can send me and you to heaven. Because Jesus shed his blood. He died in our place. And we don't have to work for it. He says, here's the gift. Will you take it? Will you take it? And we ask you today, will you take it? And you'll experience the marvelous, incredible, infinite grace of God. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your mercy and for your grace. How oh, truly you exercised judgment against Pharaoh, and in your sovereign purposes raised him up to terrify the nations and to protect your people Israel as they travel to the promised land. But you truly exercised grace and mercy to them, even though they did not deserve it. For you yourself said many times, they are stubborn, stiff-necked, and rebellious people, but you exercised grace, just as you have exercised grace to us. We love you, Father, not because there's anything good in us. We love you because you first loved us. You first sent your Son to be a propitiation for our sins. You first in your mercy and love and according to your, your sovereign plan, irresistibly drew us to Christ. Caused us to see our lost condition. Caused us to cry out to you, the merciful, eternal God. And you gave us, by the infusion of your grace, the gift of eternal life. You are worthy, Father. You are worthy of our praise, of our admiration, of our thanksgiving, of all of our service, because you have given to us, as a gift, eternal life. We thank you, Father. We worship you, and we praise you, because you are good, and you have been merciful to us as sinners. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.